The following program is presented as a public service by KTRM and the Truman Media Network. Two Republican candidates seeking the third district seat in the Missouri House participated in a forum this week in Kirksville, sponsored by the Kirksville Area Chamber of Commerce. Incumbent Representative Nate Walker and his challenger, Dr. John Bailey, were questioned by a media panel composed of John Garlock of KTVO, Paul Shipman of Bot Radio, Sarah Stubert of the Governmental Affairs Committee of the Kirksville Area Chamber, and Jason Hunsaker of the Kirksville Daily Express, who introduced the candidates. Tonight, we'll be hearing from your candidates for the Missouri House of Representatives' third district seat. Let's meet them. The incumbent, Representative Nate Walker, and primary challenger, Dr. John Bailey. Hi. These Republican candidates will be on the August 5th primary ballot. As Missouri is an open primary state, any voter, regardless of political affiliation, can select a Republican primary ballot and cast a vote in this election. The forum will follow this format. Each candidate will be given four minutes to make an opening statement and three minutes for a closing statement at our conclusion. During the panel portion, candidates will each be given two minutes to answer each question, followed by a two-minute rebuttal. I'm Jason Hunsaker from the Kirksville Daily Express, and I am one member of tonight's panel. I am joined by John Garlock of KTVO, Paul Shipman from KLTE Bot Radio Network, and Sarah Stubbert from the Chamber of Commerce Governmental Affairs Committee. Our panel members met previously to determine the format and questions for tonight's event. Panel members will also serve as moderators and reserve the right to ask follow-up questions or seek clarification if necessary. Following the panel portion, we will ask the candidates some of the questions you, the audience members, submitted prior to the event. During that section, each candidate will be given two minutes to respond to each question. There will be no rebuttals during this portion. A timekeeper, visible to the candidates, will provide visual cues with a yellow card presented when 15 seconds remain and a red card when time has expired. We ask the candidates to observe these time limits in fairness to each other. Candidates must remain in their assigned locations at all times during the forum. Candidates may not interrupt one another or ask questions of each other. Candidates must refrain from personal attacks or charges. Our panel members may interrupt the candidates if they believe the candidates are straying from the subject or if they violate other rules of the forum. Are there any questions from the candidates at this time? No, sir. No, thank you. Let's proceed. Prior to the forum, we decided via coin toss which candidate would deliver remarks first. We will then rotate that opportunity for the remainder of the forum. Dr. Bailey, please proceed with your opening statement. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event. I'd also like to thank ATSU uh, for providing the environment we're in. I'm very familiar with this room. I've spent a lot of hours in this classroom, and both as an instructor and as a student. So it's nice to come home to ATSU. Um, also, I'd like to thank our fine panel tonight, and I appreciate you all putting the effort and time into this event. As some of you know, and some of you may not know, I'm a lifelong resident of Kirksville, Missouri. I was born here. I grew up here. Uh, I participated in a lot of activities growing up. I was a Boy Scout. I was also a member of 4-H, uh, and we dealt with livestock, cattle, um, and then also horses, and we raised horses for numerous years. And I've also been involved uh, with the military in the past. Um, Actually, I started out as an E-1 and actually worked up through a sergeant and then switched over to the officer corps when I went to medical school. Through that period of time, I was deployed twice with the military, and one of them was to Kosovo, so I spent times overseas with NATO and foreign troops and helped establish the, their emergency medicine program uh, they were starting in Kosovo. Also, uh, one way I thought I could give back to the community which I've given a lot, or tried to give a lot of service back to the community, was become a K-9 law enforcement officer, and I've been doing that since uh, roughly 2003. And that was one area that I felt we needed, one area that wasn't being provided at the time, and a way to give back to the community. So 
I provide the canines. I provide my own um, self to uh, oversee the canines, and then I'm also help out with the SWAT team. Then, as a physician, uh, I attended ATSU, as I mentioned earlier, and then went on and did, took orthopedic uh, residency and spine fellowship. Since that time, I've also been chief of staff medical director at uh, the hospital, local hospital here, and I've also been um, the physician advisor, so I deal and advise the hospital on all Medicare Medicaid issues, so I'm very familiar with those. And as a physician, I've practiced approximately 20 years in Kirksville, and this is the first time I've ever sought office. I'm concerned about this community and the direction the state and country are headed. Also, we have, uh, have been settling for career politicians that generally have no experience or background in health care to deal with the government attempt to take over one-sixth of our nation's economy. And we see that every day in, uh, in my office. I have patients coming in with uh, $12,000 deductibles. The average deductible across the United States right now is 9,500. Uh, patients are getting the insurance uh, care they need. And 70% of the bills that came before the state legislature this year were medically related. We got two physicians in the state right now in the House, the representatives, and so we got a lot of politicians deciding our medical future instead of medical personnel. So with the military, with the, the Medicare and Medicaid programs, I've been dealing with uh, government-run programs for over the last 20 years. If you want an idea of how the government will run our health care system, take a look at the military and take a look at the VA system. When I was on active duty, I was allowed to operate uh, a very short period of time. We need to change uh, the way we look at health care, and we need to expand it. Also, I'm, uh, as a member of law enforcement, as a veteran, I have a right to bear arms, and as a physician, I am pro-life. Thank you. Representative Walker, your opening statement, please. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists for being here. I want to thank the Kirksville Area Chamber of Commerce, the Governmental Affairs uh, Committee, which uh, is hosting this. I used to be chairman of that committee, and then I got uh, an idea to get involved in politics and became a politician, I suppose. But uh, anyway, it's good to be here. Uh, most of you know who I am. I served you as your third district state representative the last uh, year and a half, and uh, I've appreciated that opportunity, and I'm asking for a second term to continue to work uh, for North Missouri and for the third district. Many of you may not know how big the 3rd District is, but the 3rd District, and I have a map in my office, and I also have a map uh, in my uh, uh, campaign office, so if you want to come by and see that. But on this map, there's a little circle, and that's Kirksville, and that's half the votes. And then there's an area about like this, and that's the rest of the district, and that's the other half the votes. The 3rd District is the city of Kirksville, the western parts of Adair County, the uh, entire county of Sullivan, the entire county of Putman, and the entire county of Mercer. That's about 1,850 square miles. You have to get to 60 by 30 to get to 1,800. So it's a large area, and I've tried to get through and be in, in all the communities as many times as I possibly can, but it's been a rewarding experience for me. I grew up in Macon County. I've lived in North Missouri most of my life. Uh, went to a one-room schoolhouse. Annabelle District 83, uh, went to high school at Macon, played against the Kirksville Tigers, so if you want to hold that against me, uh, you'll just have to do that. Uh, went to the University of Missouri at Columbia, have a degree in agricultural journalism, a master's degree in regional community affairs. I did postgraduate work at Duke University and also at the House Risen Institute of International Politics and Economics in uh, Germany. I've had the opportunity to serve twice in the Missouri General Assembly. In 1980, I served two terms representing Macon, Shelby, parts of Lynn, part of Knox County in the, in the legislature. I have the distinction to have served not only in the supermajority, which the Republicans uh, have or have had in the uh, legislature, but I also served in the supermajority, I mean, the super minority. So I've learned in politics that you have to work together to get things done. 
And so as your state representative, I've reached across party lines to try to get things good to happen for North Missouri and for Kirksville and for Truman State University, even AT Still. We had a great success this year. Many of you, around four or 500 people, white coats from this school were all there and, and administration and members throughout the community. We were able to get AT Still enshrined into the Hall of Famous Missourians. And it's the first time that the people or the public participated. And so I and many of you on your Facebook and other ways uh, did everything we possibly could to get votes for it. And then I educated our speaker, Tim Jones, who didn't even know who Dr. Her who didn't even know who Dr. Andrew Taylor still was. And uh, anyway, I gave him this book uh, about A.T. Still. It's about this thick, and he, he told me he read it. But the day that we had the uh, induction, it was a wonderful day, and we had a great turnout. And I feel uh, proud to be a part of that. I look forward to the rest of this debate and answering the questions. And I thank you for this opportunity to to meet with you today. Thank you. Okay, we will now begin with the panel questions. <clears throat> Our first set of questions are on the topic of education. Representative Walker, the first question will go to you. It is commonly held belief that investments in our future begins with investments in education. <clears throat> While Missourians has increased K through 12 public education funding, it remains short of what is required by the foundation formula as written in state statutes. What do you propose to address K-12 through funding? Well, I think my record already has established that I support education. I've uh, been uh, supporting it from K to, to, to 12, but also higher education, and they're all very important components. One of the things that the majority caucus is, is working on is to make sure that the foundation formula is fully funded. That's a formula that uh, has not been fully funded uh, since its inception, and so we're working to try to get more money for that. And one of the ways you get more money into government is, is uh, improving the economy and getting the economy moving again. And we've had kind of a stagnant economy for the last uh, few years, and hopefully with the recent tax uh, reform that took place uh, this year, that will be beneficial to uh, get uh, the, the economy going and, and help find funding for education. Uh, many of you know that uh, a year ago, about this time, a very controversial thing, there was a large bill, 177-page bill, that was uh, introduced. It was uh, went through. I supported it at the beginning, and then it got some changes in it. And then once we started looking at it, we found out that actually it was not just a tax cut bill or reform bill. It actually was a tax increase bill for uh, pharmaceutical products, pharmacy things, and also for uh, textbooks. So I uh, sided with 14 other rural legislators, Republican legislators, to sustain the, the veto. But we also talked about working to get a good bill passed. And so this year we passed Senate Bill 509, which I had input in, a five-page bill that had triggers in it that would protect education. And uh, we got that passed, and the governor vetoed it, and I led the way to uh, keeping it from being uh, uh, overridden. So anyway, thank you for that, and I'll be glad to answer more questions later, but my time is up. Dr. Bailey, your turn to respond. Sure. Uh, as an educator and as having gone through education for years, I'm a strong supporter of education. With the foundation formula, uh, basically it's not been fully funded. And it probably could have been funded a year before if we had passed the tax cuts a year ago. Having reviewed that bill compared to this year's bill, there's not that many differences in it. There was a pharmacy uh, change for taxes on pharmacy drugs. But that's something that could have been taken care of quickly. When we look at what's happened in Kansas since they passed a similar tax bill approximately two years ago, uh, their economy has flourished. And actually they have grown and been able to fund their educational system at a higher rate. So with the delay in the tax bill for being over a year, it's one more thing that's cost funding to our, our uh, educational people. And with the amendments and stuff that were put in place, that could have been could have been easily done a year ago. Uh, and with the foundation formula, I'm not sure everybody knows how it's funded or how it's 
put together, but actually what it does is it's based on uh, real estate taxes in the area, and then what's not funded by that is then uh, subsequently uh, assisted by the state legislature. So it's one of those issues that uh, we need to strongly support. We need to fund our um, formula so that we can get education growing. We also need to continue to have tax cuts and continue to stimulate growth in Missouri. Uh, Missouri before this was one of the 14th highest tax states in the country. We're seeing job growth at a very slow rate. It's one of those things that another year delay could have uh, been devastating to our state. Dr. Bailey, the Doc, second. Sorry, the two-minute rebuttal now sorry. for Representative sorry. Walker. Well, first of all, the uh, House Bill 253 was 177 pages. The bill we passed this year was five pages. I would say that in between five and 177, there was probably a lot of other stuff in there. I read the bill. I don't know if my uh, uh, if, if, if Dr. Bailey has read the bill or not, but uh, I read the bill. It was increasing taxes for pharmaceuticals. It was increasing taxes uh, on textbooks. And the, the, the alarming thing was everybody said, well, let's just fix it. Let's just fix it after we get it passed. Well, I've been around in the General Assembly, and I've been around before, that let's get it right the first time. We worked hard this time. We got it right, and we passed it. And uh, it's something that I'm proud to be a part of. It's the first tax cut or tax reform we've had in 100 years. Plus, I listened to the voters of the 3rd District because the Kirksville City Council, the Truman Board of Governors, uh, the school superintendents, there were only two people that really raised much cane a year ago uh, in regard to this bill. And uh, I listened to them and uh, worked hard, and we got the right kind of bill passed. And it was bipartisan. The other bill was not bipartisan, and I think we need to work towards bipartisanship to get things done. We've got to start... Quit fighting about uh, picky, picky things and get to work and solve problems. And so I think my record for education is important. And if you're not an education supporter and you represent the 3rd District, particularly the largest part of our economy in Adair County and, and in a lot of other parts of the district, then you probably are not representing the best interest of our district. Thank you very much. Dr. Bailey, two-minute rebuttal. As I said before, I'm a very strong supporter of education. I've been involved in education my whole life. Uh, going back to the tax cuts, uh, it's been shown, and it's actually Ronald Reagan's, George Bush, and all the way back to JFK have said that we needed tax cuts to stimulate the economy. Therefore, that helps fund education, and we need that education funding to support our young people. Um, but we need to get the economy growing so that we can get jobs into the area so that our young people keep quit or don't have to leave the area to find good jobs and uh, uh, to keep the family strong. Thank you. Dr. Bailey, question number two on the topic of education goes to you first. Institutions of higher education have never been more important in a global economy. Truman State University and other public institutions of higher education are well short in funding, receiving state appropriations equal to or less than what they had a decade ago, while expenses have increased significantly. How would you address this issue in the legislature? I'm well aware of funding for Truman and other state universities. As a physician, I donate my time to all their sporting activities and have been doing that for since 1997. Uh, so there's some of us that donate back to the university. Unfortunately, with a period of time where economy is growing slower in Missouri at about 3.5%, instead of the state surrounding it, which are growing at about 13.5%. And a lot of that's due to overburdensome economic or regulations put onto these businesses, and therefore they can't generate, we can't generate the revenue from taxes we need to to fund these higher education institutions at the level we should. So if we can get stimulated, the, or the economy stimulated and growing, hopefully then, we can turn around and start better funding our educational areas. And with everybody suffering around the community, we all understand that the need 
uh, to decrease taxes, to get more jobs into the area, and to get our economy growing so we can fund these things because education is one of our best resources we have in this country, and we need to keep it going strong. And having gone through all the years of education I do, I understand that more than probably the average person. Representative Walker. Well, I think it's very important that uh, the third district have a strong representation in the state capitol in regard to support of education. That's why I meet once a month with all the superintendents of schools in my district, and then I also meet frequently with Dr. Pino, the president of Truman State University, and I also meet with Dr. Phelps from time to time, the president here. Uh, education is crucial for us, and to get the input from those people who are actually in the classrooms or in the uh, uh, administrative side of the building uh, to understand education is very important. And you know, when I got elected uh, just a little less than two years ago, uh, I made it a point that I was going to make Truman State University one of my major priorities when I ran, when I served in the legislature. That night, I actually even wore a, a Truman sweatshirt just to show that I was uh, for, for Truman. But uh, I've listened to Dr. Pano. I've listened to the Board of uh, Governors. I meet with the Board of Governors about three or four times a year, and uh, they come to my office. Uh, I come to their office. I've attended board meetings, and uh, I just think it's important that you get that input. The economy is important. We're working on ways to improve the economy. Uh, I think I have a very strong record in, in regard to that. I just uh, received a 100 percent uh, rating from the Missouri Chamber of Commerce. One of 18 legislators did receive that, and then also have a 100 percent rating with the NFIB, which is the National Federation of Independent Businesses. So I think we have to work to make the economy stronger, but we have to also make sure that we work with the administrators and the teachers and the people that are actually educating our students to make sure that uh, we get the right input. I serve on the Higher Education Committee of the House. Thank you very much. Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal. Uh, working with the people down at the level where we actually see what the funding problems are is, is a very interesting thing at Truman State University. And dealing with the athletic department and looking at the, the shorting in their funding and having to lose certain um, things such as the men's golf team is, uh, I know, somewhat devastating to the university. But I actually see those funding things. Also, I'm willing to meet with uh, Mr. Pino or any of the members of the board and talk about those issues. I also serve with uh, Mrs. Pino on the hospital board of directors so that uh, routinely we can get input from different members of the community on those things. So I think we need to strongly uh, look at secondary education as it's one of our biggest assets we have. Representative Walker, your rebuttal. I just will reestablish what I said earlier. I'm a strong supporter of public education. Uh, when House Bill 253 was brought up, uh, it was very clear that that was going to be detrimental not only to Truman State University but all the other higher educational facilities in the state of Missouri, also to our elementary and secondary schools, particularly in the rural areas. And that's why 14 other rural Missouri Republican legislators broke tradition with their party to do the right thing. And I challenge uh, anybody else, uh, if you, if whoever didn't do that a year ago, our schools would be in a lot worse shape. And we have a good tax bill to work with now. It has safeguards in it. There's triggers that uh, regard that we have to have certain growth before those, those reforms or cuts take place. But uh, Truman State University, education is very important to the third district. And you better listen to the people here and not the people that are giving all the information out of St. Louis to uh, what's good policy and so forth. Because there's a gentleman uh, in St. Louis that has a very, very bad prescription for rural schools. And I'm fighting him. Uh, you listen to the radios. You listen to the TV. You listen to that. We have some influence that's coming from, from St. Louis with a guy that has a bad, bad prescription for rural schools. And I'm going to fight, and I'm going to stand up against him. And I guarantee, if you elect me for a second term, the third district is not for sale. Our next question is on the state budget. And Representative Walker, we'll go to you first. 
The Missouri legislature and Governor Jay Nixon have engaged in annual budget disputes. State-funded institutions are left in limbo when Governor Nixon withholds budget funds in what he says is an effort to balance unconstitutional budgets sent to him by the legislature. How do you propose the state could work more effectively to solve this problem? Well, I think we, we need to get along a little bit better. Um, this year, uh, when the House sat down with the Senate and with the administration, the governor's office, uh, they all had different figures as far as growth potential. The governor said that the uh, budget potential was going to be four point something, and then the House was around 3%. Uh, I sit on the front row at the General Assembly, uh, right there on the front row, so I get to see everything. And so when the governor gets up to give his state of the state address, he looks at me because he knows me because we used to coach sports together with our sons. But he also knows me because uh, we've served together in, on various committees and so forth. But the key that we have to do is to make sure that we start the process with good figures and then we continue to work towards making sure that we get our priorities right. Fortunately for the state of Missouri, we have a balanced budget amendment, which is something that uh, they need in Washington, D.C. But to get the budget uh, direction going, uh, the members of the budget committee work long hours and uh, the governor has a history of withholding and then releasing. And that's, that's part of his strategy. Uh, last year when we had House Bill 253, he withheld a lot of money and then he gradually released everything. And uh, it's just his strategy. I don't think it's the right strategy. But uh, we are working on ways now to improve the budget process. And I think it's uh, term limits have kind of uh, changed the budget process a little bit too. But we've got to just continue to work together to try to make sure that we uh, come up with a balanced budget and a budget that meets the real needs of the communities in the state of Missouri. Dr. Bailey? I think it's great that our uh, state has a balanced budget system. Uh, I don't think it's right that the government withholds funds uh, as political weapons. I think that those funds, um, they should be able to work on the balanced budget and everybody work together and get that money released and out to the areas it needs to go to. And I think to improve that, we need to continue to look at tax cuts and we need to continue to look at ways to grow the economy. Uh, because if we get that, well, then we get increased revenue and then we have more funding for all those projects. And with all the... And with um, all the states around Missouri growing, we need to look at some of the systems that are going on in some of these other states and come up with new ways to grow the economy, to get business growing and fund these areas so that we don't have to go through governor's withholding of funds to support all these different uh, entities that need to be funded. So we need to work with them and uh, work the state legislature needs to, we need to come up with ways to keep a nice balanced budget and hopefully be able to fund all the activities we need in the state. Representative Walker, your rebuttal. Part of it is also a little strategy. You know, I mentioned earlier that I served in the minority party back in the 80s, but we had a, a, a Republican governor, Kit Bond. And so there's always this friendly little uh, relationship. Uh, who's the toughest guy on the block or who can, who controls the budget? The administration, which is the governor's uh, office, they want to they want to be kind of the king player. The general assembly wants to be the king player. That's just kind of a natural phenomena, and I think we do a pretty good job. We have a balanced budget every year, and uh, yes, there's withholdings. It's really a bad thing for the schools because they have to readjust their uh, budgets to to make sure that uh, they don't over budget before they get the money released. But I think. Uh, we're going to be looking at different ways to streamline and to make it more efficient to where the governor may not have all the total abilities to do withholding the way he does. But it's just part of the process. And uh, being in the arena is, a, is kind of tough. And so, uh, you know, we fight it out uh, among ourselves in, our, in, in uh, the legislature. We fight it out sometimes with the executive branch. But uh, it's just part of the process. And uh, we have a balanced budget, luckily, that if we didn't, we'd be in the same predicament that they are in Washington, D.C. But uh, I've worked hard uh, to work in a bipartisan spirit to get things accomplished for our area, 
And uh, I think uh, uh, we just had to continue to work to make sure that we present a budget to the governor that's balanced and has the priorities right. And uh, then he has to also scrutinize it and make sure that uh, he doesn't play politics with it either. Thank you. Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal. Very much. I'd reiterate the same comments I did earlier that it's nice that we do have a state balanced budget. and. But the governor withholding funds for certain things, especially with higher education and with the uh, school systems, is not a good thing to do for our people or for the people in our communities. Uh, we need to find new ways to decrease tax taxes again, stimulate the economy, get it growing, so that we continue to fund uh, education at all levels. Thank you. Our next questions are related to health care. Dr. Bailey, you will answer first. The Missouri legislature has the power to enable access to health care through expanded Medicaid to more than 200,000 low-income Missourians. Where do you stand on this issue? I'm against Medicaid expansion, and I, and I have been the entire time. Um, basically, Mex Medicaid is a not very good functioning system at the moment. Uh, reimbursement to physicians is poor at the least, and we're having a lot of physicians who are either leaving practice or those types of things because of the expansion or possible expansion of Medicaid, but definitely the expansion of Obamacare. And if we want to see what, again, what a federal-run system looks like, look at the military, look at the VA. When uh, I've been deployed on active duty, I was allowed to operate two to three days a month, which limits care and limits a lot of care to people. When I was in Kosovo, uh, I saw more people in three months there than they did in the ha previous uh, two years because I'm used to working. But with that system, they're not. So they delay care, uh, people can't get access to care, and then they ship off bigger procedures to specific medical centers so that people have to travel to get care done. If we look at the VA system, the way they're delaying care at the moment and people don't have that access to care, um, doesn't bode well good for the federal government running that type of program or any other type of uh, um, those types of federal programs. So Medicaid expansion right now, the way the system is in Missouri, would be devastating. Uh, and it would be devastating to our medical community, which is also go already going through hard times because of uh, a lot of the problems going on with insurance and uh, Medicare. So we're, uh, we are seeing physicians leave it. We're seeing physicians being bought out by hospitals and those entities, and then we're losing the physician voice, which are strong advocates for patients and their families. Representative Walker. Okay. First of all, I uh, have opposed Medicaid uh, expansion without reform or transformation. Uh, we need to look at uh, making it more efficient, and uh, we need to look towards uh, ad adopting a system that uh, actually accomplishes something good, particularly the young children and the developmentally disabled. They need the assistance that Medicaid provides and we need to look towards ways to eliminate waste and fraud and, and, and those kind of things. On the national level, when we talk about the uh, Affordable Care Act or, or Obamacare, uh, one of the problems that took place in regard to that was it was one of these things that uh, in government it doesn't work very good. It's when one party has the dominant power to do something, they just kind of forced it uh, out. They didn't really pay attention to what all the things that were in it. And as a result, we have a very bad product, and it's uh, failing. And uh, as, a as, as a result of that, uh, the National Health Care uh, Administration part of Obamacare is, is poorly done. And so I, I don't support that. We need to start all over and look at ways to streamline, make health care a more affordable thing for all, all people. But uh, as far as health care in the state of Missouri, the expansion of uh, uh, Medicaid uh, is not going to happen unless there's some major reform, and I would support looking at the reforms, and then we could take a look at uh, what's best for all people. But uh, Medicaid has been a very positive thing for a lot of people who uh, need help, particularly the young people and the developmentally disabled. 
Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal. I take care of a lot of Medicaid patients, and as a physician that's required to take emergency room call, I'm required to take care of those patients, so I have to take care of Medicaid. It's also against the law for me not to bill for Medicaid. I know there's been some accusations made through this campaign of how much I've collected from that. We broke that down per patient encounter, and of that, it figured out per patient encounter, including surgeries, procedures, everything I do, I get $10.57 per encounter, and my costs are higher than that. I find it interesting that my opponent says that he's not been for Medicaid expansion. When we go back to September 26, 2013, Kirksville Daily Express, he voiced that he was in support of Medicaid expansion. Also this spring, he co-sponsored a bill, House Bill 1091, that, again, was for Medicaid expansion. And then he came up and he's advocated through uh, the subsequent months for Medicaid expansion, so I find it interesting that all of a sudden in June, now he's against Medicaid expansion. Um, and I've been against Medicaid expansion the whole time. So I'm not sure how it is that we support things and now all of a sudden that we're against them again. Representative Walker, your rebuttal. House Bill 1091 that he refers to is a bill that I and seven other uh, Republican legislators uh, sponsored. Uh, it's a bill that deals with Medicaid for with uh, reform and with a sensible uh, way of transformation. And, uh, you know, you can just be, be no, 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 no. We've got four or five members of our caucus that never vote yes for anything. And, you know, that might be the safest way to do it, but I think we need to look towards solutions and and finding ways to find uh, solutions to problems. And uh, Medicaid uh, expansion without reform is not going to happen. Uh, he can say what he wants to about uh, what he wants to say. But uh, I've been down there in the trenches, and I know what is going on with uh, this, the bill that I've worked on. I went to uh, nine or ten uh, committee meetings uh, throughout the state, spent 80 hours throughout the state last year on a Medicaid transformation hearing, and the results of those hearings was the reason why we put together the House Bill 1801 that I co-sponsored, and uh, it's, a, it's a tool. Every time you introduce a bill, it doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect, uh, but it's at least a tool to get the, the agenda or getting things moving forward to solving problems. We've got to do more than just say no all the time. We've got to solve problems and work together to make sure that the real needs of the communities and the real needs of North Missouri are met. And uh, I pledge to you that I will continue to work towards uh, finding solutions to the health care needs of the people of North Missouri. Representative Walker, this next question is directed to you. To date, the Missouri legislator has not taken steps to establish a statewide insurance exchange to access coverage under the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, instead leaving Missourians to access a site run by the federal government. Recently, a court of appeals ruling called into question whether those who signed up through the federal site would qualify for discounts on those plans. Where do you stand on the specific issue of Missouri establishing its own health care exchange? Right now I oppose it because I don't think that it's going to solve anything because until the, the national government, the federal government addresses the problems with Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, there's no need for us to address that issue. Dr. Bailey? I'm against setting up an exchange in Missouri. I don't feel that uh, the expansion of Obamacare and government control in our medical system is the best way to go. I think we need to go back to the private insurance industry and set up uh, where we can go across state lines to give insurance so that then we have higher competition so that we can bring down the rates for individuals right now. With the Affordable Care Act, with what it's doing to the country, uh, again, we're seeing uh, deductibles come in the office of patients with $12,000. It's like, why even have insurance if it's that high? So the average across the nation right now is 9,500. We have a lot of patients coming in who have uh, anywhere 2,500 between that $12,000 range. And that's a lot of money for people to come up at one time. Obamacare is not going to solve that. We need to go to, back to private insurance. 
there's every time we do everything, uh, the private citizens do a better job at it than government overreach and federal control. President Walker, your rebuttal. Uh, House Bill 1801 uh, was beginning to address some of those things, and uh, I stand by my answer. I would not support it. Actually, it was House Bill 1901. 1901. But again, I stand against uh, the expansion of Obamacare or exchange site in Missouri. I think we need to, again, go back to the private industry. We need to go back to uh, being able to get insurance across state lines so that we can bring down the cost of health care and insurance to those individuals and hopefully bring back uh, prosperity to the me medical profession so that we can continue to bring young physicians into it have, who have a bright outlook for their future. Right now you talk to a lot of them and it's, it's uh, not looking too good for them. Thank you. Dr. Bailey, the last question on the topic of health care goes to you first. The topic of tort reform is addressed when discussing the nation's health care system. What do you feel the state legislature should do in this area? There needs to be a lot done in this area. There's many frivolous lawsuits in the state of Missouri, as my opponent so uh, has brought out. I've been sued ten times, and there's that's uh, common knowledge apparently now. But that's common across the United States, orthopedic surgeons. Uh, routinely, the average across the nation is 15. Unfortunately, uh, we can't control who sues us. And it's it's uh, open season on doctors, unfortunately. And we have to defend those, and there's a lot of cost going with defending those. I was in a case in uh, May in uh, Knox County, which had been going on for seven years. I got a 12-0 verdict in my favor because, once again, nothing was done wrong. But it's just more uh, proof that we need a strong tort system revision in this state, and we need a loser pay system. The way it is now, if we lose a case, or if we win a case, we still have to pay for it. And it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend every one of those lawsuits. So we need a loser pay system, as has been done in Texas, bring down the cost of uh, the legal aspects of medical care, and we'll bring down the cost, and that way it'll make it affordable for everybody. But um, as physicians, you know, there's, there's actually people who have quit medicine over the legal aspects of medicine, or else they go into a non-practicing type environment where they're basically working for insurance companies and deciding whether or not we can do procedures. So it's having a big detrimental effect on uh, health care. Representative Walker, your response? I've supported tort reform in the past in the legislature. I have a, a record that has supported uh, tort reform. Uh, not all suits that are brought are frivolous. Uh, I didn't bring this issue up in the campaign. It was brought to me by several people who felt that uh, their care was not sufficient and uh, it became an issue. And uh, if all these cases are frivolous, then I'm, I'm sure they were all dropped, but they weren't. There was uh, results of a payment made because these were not frivolous suits. And I stand by uh, uh, Mrs. Couch's story, and I stand by the other things that we've done in this campaign to bring this out. Uh, this campaign started out with the theme, physician, not a politician. And so when you bring out the fact that you want to highlight what you are, then I think you have to be responsible for the results of what you've done. Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal? Sure. Um, again, majority of lawsuits are frivolous. Uh, unfortunately, I can't talk about the case in question because I'm uh, held under HIPAA, so I can't discuss that individual. But as far as uh, injuries and significant injury goes, uh, we take care of a lot of significant problems and devastating injuries on people. And we can't keep everybody happy. I mean, nobody can. So there's going to be one or two people who may not be happy with the care they received. 
but if um, that doesn't or shouldn't always generate lawsuits, it commonly does. And if nine out of ten lawsuits I had resulted in uh, being dismissed, that's 90% frivolous lawsuits. That's way too many. And so we do have open season on doctors. Uh, doctors are getting sued all the time. And just because somebody has a bad outcome doesn't mean we did anything wrong. That has to do with uh, part of the healing process and also has to do with the nature of the injury. And there's a lot more um, devastating injuries that people may not have an ideal outcome. But that doesn't mean the physician did anything wrong. As medical director and as overseeing all those programs at the hospital, I get a look at a lot of those cases. And there are, uh, we do take care of ones that are any problems. So, and with the National Health Care Act right now, we are scrutinized at a very high level on our quality. And if we take this institution in town, it has one of the highest quality low infections rates in the state, and you can find that out on the Medicare and Medicaid websites. Representative Walker, your rebuttal. Uh, I stand by the statement that I made. I stand by Mrs. Couch's statement. Uh, she's just one of several that have come to us, and uh, 10 malpractice suits is not, uh, uh, I would think, doing a good ca case for your, for your clients and so forth. Uh, Tort reform in regard to that, uh, we need to look at reform, but uh, after seeing some of the cases that uh, have been presented uh, by, by uh, the gentleman over here, uh, I'm concerned because there's some people that said their lives drastically impacted by it, and Mrs. Couch is one of those families that did so, and she's not the only one. Our next questions are related to human rights and same-sex marriage. The first question is for Representative Walker. The city of Kirksville last year passed an ordinance adding sexual orientation and gender identity to the list of things prohibited to discriminate against in employment, housing, and public accommodation. Where do you stand on a potential statewide application of similar legislation? I'm against discrimination, period. And uh, I do believe that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, there is legislation that has been uh, introduced uh, during the last several years. Uh, it hasn't gone any place, and uh, I've not uh, made a final uh, decision on whether I would support it or not. But I think uh, really your question is two different things. But discrimination, uh, we can't have discrimination. And so if it's a total discrimination type bill, I would probably support it. But. Uh, uh, I remember discrimination taking place as a young child in North Missouri. Uh, my grandfather and grandmother were in the fur business. We uh, dealt, they dealt with uh, the Jewish community in New York. And during the 60s and even the 50s and the 60s, there were motels and uh, places that would not serve Jewish people. And then we also know that the black uh, uh, discrimination was still going on in the 50s and 60s. Uh, we've got to get beyond uh, discrimination, and we've got to, to look at things uh, that are important to, to everyone. But I'm opposed to discrimination of any sort. Dr. Bailey? Uh, I'm opposed to discrimination also of any sort. And having been in the areas I've been, I've, I actually trained in New York City. I worked with many people from di many different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, we worked with Jewish people, we worked with people from uh, Iran, Syria, uh, over the Middle East. I worked with people from Philippines, different places. And when I was also in New York, we took care of all kinds of uh, different patients. And we never looked at any patient differently, and I still don't. Uh, you know, I took care of uh, some of the hospitals I went to in New York City had two floors of AIDS patients, and we treat everybody the same, and we took care of them. And that's what we still do in medicine. We don't look at that as, uh, as a problem. So, yes, I'm against discrimination at any level. We have National um, Non-Discrimination Act, 
which oversees all that. If somebody makes a complaint, they're very thorough at investigating those and taking care of those problems. So I don't feel that we need more bureaucracy and government overreach and more ordinances to oversee that when the federal government does a very good job at doing that with their National Non-Discrimination Act. Representative Walker, your rebuttal. Uh, I'm against discrimination, and I believe that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman, and uh, there is uh, not a policy on the national level to deal with that right now. Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal. Uh, National Non-Discrimination Act covers all of that. Also that they uh, cover those things very thoroughly. They take those complaints at heart. Uh, having been in law enforcement, that if those types of complaints come through, then uh, you know we make sure they get to the right channels. So I think we have very good uh, federal control over that. I don't think we need state, local issues, more ordinance, more bureaucracy for those type of things. I think we have a very good system. Dr. Bailey, you'll answer this question first. In 2004, Missourians established a constitutional amendment recognizing marriage as being between a man and a woman. Currently, similar laws in several states are being overturned by their respective Supreme Courts. What are your feelings today on this issue? I believe marriage is between a man and woman, and according to my religious background and upbringing, uh, I agree with those convictions that uh, marriage is between a man and woman. I don't believe we need to overturn that. Uh, I think there's other avenues that we could look at, but marriage is as far as I'm concerned, between a man and a woman. Could you describe these other avenues? Well, I mean, there's different things people can look at. If they want to make a civil union or something like that, that might be a reasonable way to approach it. But as far as calling it a marriage, uh, no, I consider a marriage between a man and a woman. Representative Walker? I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal. Already stated. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, we now have several questions addressing amendments uh, to the Missouri Constitution. Uh, the first question will be directed to you, Representative Walker. Uh, Missourians will be faced with five potential amendments to the state constitution on August 5th. Given the difficulty of repealing such amendments, where do you stand on this uh, on this action in general? This action in general, I've uh, supported uh, putting Amendment 1 and Amendment 7 on the ballot. Uh, 7 is for the uh, roads, and 1 is for uh, the farm issue, the right to farm. Uh, once they're on the ballot, it's up to the will of the people to make that decision on how they want to vote. And uh, I will be voting for both of those because I think there's, as an individual, not as your state representative, but as an individual, because I think there's a need for infrastructure work on our roads. Uh, I talked about how big the 12th district or the 3rd district was, and uh, I make frequent trips. I have a, an F-150 pickup that I bought locally here in Kirksville, and uh, it's just a little over two years old. It's got 75,000 miles on it. And I make those trips all across and I know the shortcut to Princeton, but uh, when it's dark and, and I haven't been on that road for a while, I take 136 across through Unionville and down 63. But there is a major, major need for farm-to-market road improvement. Uh, MoDOT has worked hard to come up with projects for every area of the state, and uh, I'm going to personally vote for it. Everybody else can make their own decisions in regard to that, and I'm also going to vote for the member one, the right to farm, but that's something that everybody else uh, needs to consider, their, whatever they think is the right way to do it. I'm not uh, uh, going to tell people what to do. Once uh, they get the opportunity, I'll give them the opportunity to be a legislator for a day. Dr. Bailey, your response? Uh, on amendment, uh, one and on amendment seven. Actually, I'm for amendment one. I think it's a good bill. I think we need to protect our farmers. If we don't protect our farmers, we're going to see a massive rise in uh, food costs. Um, 
with some of the groups that are supporting that bill and trying to get it killed, uh, there's some misnomers out there. One, uh, there's already state laws that outside entities, foreign uh, foreigners, can only own 1% of the land in Missouri. I mean, that's a state law that's already been dealt with. So foreigners coming in and getting involved in that is basically a non-issue. Also, um, the other thing they were talking about was corporate farming. Well, the state legislature's already dealt with that issue also, in that uh, the only corporate areas that can be farmed right now are the ones in existence. So that can't really expand, and the state legislature took care of that. So those are arguments they're using which are not really viable arguments. But if they come in and get the things done that they want to do to our farmers, it's going to increase massively the cost of uh, food. On number seven, I'm against number seven. Uh, it's one of the biggest tax increases we've ever seen in the state of Missouri. We do need infrastructure. We do need roads down out in this area. But unless we can get uh, more support from D MoDOT up in this area, we're not going to see that. We're going to be paying for massive increases in the roads and those types of things in St. Louis, Kansas City, Springfield, and Branson, and we're not going to see the money spent on infrastructure in our area. Uh, at this point, if I, if I may, we'll ask you to both um, keep your rebuttals limited to the topics of Amendment 1 and Amendment 7. Okay. Uh, basically, I'm just, uh, in regard to Amendment 1, the right to farm, it's being supported by the Missouri Farm Bureau, uh, all the major uh, ag commodity groups, and so that's why I support it. Uh, I was a co-sponsor of it. That was actually the first bill that I signed uh, on to uh, when I got uh, elected. And in regard to the transportation, unlike uh, the gentleman to my left, um, I attended uh, many, many meetings put on by the Missouri uh, Transportation Commission. I've actually testified before them, and one of the things that I talked about was we need to, to get a bipartisan approach to solving some of the road needs. I testified and went to all the hearings that were here. The, the issues or the uh, projects are all identified uh, in and, you know, in, in this third district, we have two area uh, uh, districts. Uh, we have the Northeast, which is over at Hannibal. We also have the, the district uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, St. Joe. But uh, we have uh, lots of roads in the third district, and we need to keep those roads in good shape because infrastructure and roads are part of the economic development plan. And when we had the meeting last week on site inspection, infrastructure was one of the big things that they kept talking about. Thanks to Harry Beard and thanks to progressive people in Kirksville of uh, working to get a uh, special tax district formed. We have four-lane roads now all the way from Kirksville to San Luis, Kirksville to Truman, or Kirksville to Kansas City, and it makes it a very positive thing and a safety concern for all the students that come here to Truman and to AT Still. Thank you. Once again, I uh, strongly support Amendment 1. I think it's good for our farmers. We need to protect our farmers. Agriculture is one of our biggest businesses in Missouri, and we need to keep it that way, and we need to make it easier for the family farmer instead of establishing all these uh, rules and guidelines that they have to follow. They're the experts on it, and they need to be the ones doing the farming. On Amendment 7, we do need infrastructure. I've dealt with the DOT before, actually from the other side. And actually with the bypass, they cut my mom's property in two. Now you to get from one side to the other, you got to go way around roads. And having dealt with the DOT, or the Missouri Department of Transportation, they don't live up to their word. And we've seen it in the past where we have massive tax increases or we pay for it from our area. And then all the infrastructure goes to the cities. And we out here in rural Missouri need to ensure before a bill like that goes through that we're going to be taken care of and provided for and not just the big cities, as it seems to be done in the past. Very rarely do we get done, anything done north of I-70. The four-lane highway project was a good one. Um, but until 
until we're assured to get money and we have commissioners on that board of directors for the DOT that's actually from North Missouri, we're not going to see that happen. So I would say vote no. KTRM, Kirksville. Dr. Bailey, the next question goes to you first. Where do you stand on Amendment 5, which refers to guns? As most people in the community know, as a law enforcement officer and being ex-military, I am probably one of the strongest gun supporters there are out there. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the NRA endorsement. Usually that goes to the incumbent but hopefully we have the NRA voters. As most of you know, I've been a strong supporter of NRA and the Friends of NRA. I've been sponsoring vacants for the Friends of NRA for about the last 15 to 20 years. I'm always at their meetings and I'm always out there and uh, we try to give, uh, give them strong support. As most of you know, I, as a deputy sheriff, uh, I not only talk the talk, I walk the walk. Representative Walker? I'm supportive of the Amendment 5. Uh, I've been a life member of the NRA since 1978. Uh, during the 1980s, I was endorsed by the NRA, uh, even when I was running against an incumbent in 1980. So they don't always give the endorsement to the incumbent. Um, but I am proud to have the endorsement of the NRA. And uh, I've served as uh, the master of ceremonies for the Bianchi Cup a couple of times in their awards. And that, that uh, first uh, took place in Columbia, Missouri. And uh, I've been a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and I will continue to support it. I have a 100% voting record with them. I've co-sponsored many bills. I was endorsed uh, by the NRA when I ran for lieutenant governor. When I uh, was uh, uh, last time when I ran, I was endorsed by the NRA. And um, I'm proud of that endorsement. But the Second Amendment is something that if you're not uh, supportive of for the third district, you're not uh, uh, representing this district in a, in a good way because uh, we respect uh, the right to have our arms and we respect the right to hunt and fish and do things that uh, the Second Amendment has some protection over. So I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment and I'm gonna support uh, uh, the, uh, the Amendment 5 and I'm proud to be endorsed by the NRA. Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal. Again, I'm a strong supporter of Amendment 5 and a strong supporter of the NRA and the Second Amendment. Um, I'm an avid gun enthusiast and actually uh, do a lot of self-defensive uh, shooting, so I actually go out and get involved in uh, a lot of those activities. And like I say, I walk the walk. Nobody has to worry about the Second Amendment or uh, the right to bear arms with me. Representative Walker, your rebuttal. Uh, again, uh, I'm endorsed by the NRA. Uh, they make sometimes they make dual endorsements. They've actually made dual endorsements uh, on various races here, uh, both the. NRA endorsement and also the Missouri Right to Life endorsement are exclusively mine because of my record in the legislature and for my strong uh, support for both of those issues. This next question will go to Representative Walker first. We'd like to ask you both, generally speaking, about the wisdom in so many amendments to the Missouri Constitution. Given the difficulty in repealing such amendments, is this a wise tool to use to change our state's laws? Well, it sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Uh, in the particular case of changing the Constitution, uh, you have to go to the, the voter to get that accomplished. Uh, and so uh, there are provisions. There's five amendments uh, in August, and there will be some amendments uh, taking place in, in uh uh, November, but it's an opportunity to give people an opportunity to, to have a say, and uh, I think that's good, and uh, giving people the opportunity to make a decision one way or the other. Uh, you know, sometimes there's not as much trust in, in government, uh, particularly from Washington, D.C., but uh, this is an opportunity for people to get into the arena along with those people that are in the legislature or in the Congress to have a say, and so... Uh, 
uh, it's part of the Constitution that we have the ability to do this, and so either by initiative petition or e either by action of the legislature, that's why we had these amendments on the, on the ballot uh, in August and also in November. Dr. Bailey? Uh, I think some avenues, uh, that process is good. I think amendments to protect our farmers and put it stronger into our uh, con state constitution is a good thing to do. Also with uh, the right to bear arms, I think that's good to put in our state constitution. Some of the other avenues that are some of the other things, uh, such as seven and some of those, uh, it's somewhat more questionable because it seems like Northeast Missouri sometimes gets an unfair shake in that things that are passed in this area may, then we find a big opposition in the city. So they may not necessarily re reflect our personal views or the views of the community out here. So sometimes uh, it might be better for the good and the will of the people to have that done at the state legislature level instead of uh, letting St. Louis and Kansas City and some of those areas decide what our state's going to go to. Representative Walker, your rebuttal. Well, I think it's pretty simple. Let the welfare of the people be the supreme law. That's our state motto. That's kind of the fundamental part of, of representation and government in general. So if somebody gets an amendment on the ballot, then let the public figure out what they want. And um, I just think that it's not a bad form of doing things. Uh, sometimes there's not political courage in the legislature to, to take on issues, and then sometimes there's uh, issues that uh, need to be addressed by the general public uh, through initiative petition or through action of the legislature. So again, I say let the people make the decision. They have the opportunity. and. Uh, you know, it's kind of ironic that uh, uh, we're talking about St. Louis so much because uh, St. Louis got a lot of interest in North Missouri this year during this election. So uh, we need to just vote the way we think it's right here. And uh, I, I support uh, having the opportunity to, to let the people make a decision. Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal. Yeah, apparently after the MEC reports last night, uh, St. Louis does have a large interest in uh, North Missouri. Uh, companies like Monsanto and uh, Trial Lawyers Associations and other avenues that have given uh, money to my opponent. Also, since he supported uh, ball stadiums and all that stuff in uh, downtown St. Louis at uh, taxpayer expense. Again, going back to Amendment 1, we need to protect the farmer. The thing is, is with all those special interest groups, um, which have funded all over 80 percent of his campaign so far uh we may see that bill or that amendment beat in the st louis area which would be unfortunate because we need to protect our farmers and putting that type of amendment on a state issue like that if the people in st louis and kansas city don't understand that and all these special groups such as PETA and the humane society which are funding campaigns against that get that beat in St. Louis or Kansas City, that's going to help hurt our farmers out in the rural communities. So sometimes those issues need protected by the uh, more the state legislature than putting it to a statewide vote. Dr. Bailey, you'll answer first. Our final two panel questions. Missourians do not automatically pay sales tax on internet purchases. What are your feelings on a state law to change this? Uh, once again, I'm against all taxes. So even taxing the internet or internet sales, I'm not for increasing uh, taxes at that level. Uh, even though it might uh, increase revenue or, or some of those aspects, but uh, as far as internet sales, I'm not an advocate for increasing taxes. Representative Walker. Wow. My opponent is against all taxes. We have to have a few taxes to have a few basic things. But anyway, uh, right now, uh, I'm not in support of that tax. 
Dr. Bailey, your rebuttal. Yeah, no, I'm not supporting it. Representative Walker, this question is directed to you. Um, Missouri has perhaps the most lax campaign finance laws in the country. It is the only state without limits on political contributions or gifts for lobbyists. What, if any, steps do you feel the legislator should take regarding campaign finance laws? Well, right now I could say, you know, I've experienced uh, about 275,000 or more coming from one group in St. Louis to try to, to defeat me or maybe destroy me. But, uh, yeah, we do need to look at uh, reform and campaign uh, disclosure. Uh, I think if you look at my record as far as lobbyist uh, expenses and that sort of thing, I think I rank like 153 or way down the line, uh, less than $1,000 uh, uh, per session. Uh, but yeah, there needs to be some reform. One person, one billionaire can't or should not have this much influence in an election. When you know I'm being attacked because Monsanto gave me a little bit of money. Uh, not very much, but a good uh, contribution. I'm appreciative of that. But you know, Monsanto is very important to the agriculture community. Monsanto is in, is in support of Proposition A or Proposition One, and Monsanto does a lot to make sure that we have breakthroughs in agriculture production, particularly in plant production. I've toured the Monsanto uh, plant uh, or the uh, facilities in San Luis County. Uh, several times, and uh, they're working on all kinds of different genetic things for plants. And you know, if we don't uh, continue to work efficiently with genetics, uh, we're not going to be able to feed the world. But uh, reform for uh, campaign laws, I'm, I've been talking to uh, Secretary of State uh, Kander. He had a proposal last year. I almost uh, signed on with him, and I've had discussions with him uh, uh, as early as. Uh, last month, and so I look forward to looking at that issue. I think it's going to be one that's going to be very important, and I'll tell you what, the Rex money is going to be toxic next year. Mark my word. Dr. Bailey. Uh, I'm for some type of uh, campaign finance reform. Uh, as in the medical field, we're regulated all the time. In fact, uh, it, it's very hard for uh, one of the people, our representatives from a drug company or those to even take us out to dinner anymore. I mean, we're put under massive constraints. I think the government ought to be put under a similar type constraint program so that it's not influencing all of this. Rex, he keeps talking about, is not running for office. My vote's brought now for sale. You can talk to my representatives who bring me equipment all the time to work on people. I use what's best, and I decide what's best this year. Uh, he didn't have a problem with it two years ago when he was running for office. And Mr. Segenfeld, who he refers to, who I've never met, I didn't even know his name till he started bringing it up with the campaign, supported him and uh, previously supported Zach Wyatt. The Club for Growth, which is the group that supported me and endorsed me that he's talking about, is for lowering taxes. It's for making smaller government and for increasing jobs. Who in this room can have a problem with that? So I don't know where all this special interest money is except for his coming, which is 80% out of our district, which um, with some of the votes and some of the tax or increases in spending we've seen in the St. Louis area could be a problem. Your rebuttal. Uh, if my opponent uh, would like to to uh, say that I've uh, broken some sort of statute or or done something illegal, then let him be specific. But uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, fifty thousand dollar donation from one group and then two hundred and fifty thousand or around that figure coming from one group, Club for Growth. Yeah, they donated to my campaign, and you know what? I proved that it didn't uh, influence me because when they came to me last year, they said, Representative Walker, if you don't do what we tell you to do on House Bill 253, we'll spend a million dollars to defeat me. And I said, you'll just have to do that. They're, you know, 
they're going to do it, I guess, because they, the money just keeps rolling in and rolling in and rolling in. But uh, that's pretty, pretty silly. Pretty, uh, it's pretty obvious what's happening. One group in St. Louis, one businessman, is upset because. A group of people were independent, voted their district, and did the right thing, and he's upset. He's a chess player, and he's just playing chess with us little people out here in uh, uh, North Missouri. The problem is he's found and chose the wrong guy to play chess with because as long as I'm your state representative, this district is not for sale, and I'm going to stand up, and I guarantee you, the big issue will come after this campaign. I will win on Tuesday with the support of you people, and I ask for that support. But this money is going to be so toxic that uh, people are not going to be wanting it anymore after this cycle and the cycles ahead. Could you be able to rebuttal? Sure. I don't know where he's talking about 250000 in my MEC report. Uh, definitely show that the only money I've received from this individual was the $50,000 donation. Now, when other people receive $25,000 from trial or attorneys associations, I mean, apparently that's not an issue. This $250,000, I'm not sure if he's talking about he got it, but I didn't get it. So I don't know where that's coming from. Anybody that's dealt with me with, that's a representative for any prosthetic company, no, I'm not for sale. My patients aren't for sale. They've tried to get me to use different products at different times. I use whatever products the best. And I've always stood for my values, and I don't uh, uh, influence is uh, not bought. So, again, the club for growth is not one person. There's members in this community that have been on TV doing advertisements that are members of the Club for Growth. There's members of the Club for Growth all over the state. So it's not one individual. It's not just one billionaire who started out his life as an orphan and then came up through the educational process, got into uh, apparently hedge funds, and apparently became wealthy. So. With his background in education, with his background as an orphan, he's a success story. But again, he's not Club for Growth. Club for Growth is many different individuals who make up that group, and he has even no say-so on their board of directors. So uh, there's a lot of outside influence in here. 80% of his fundings come from outside sources. So that's just, unfortunately, part of the present campaign and against um, for campaign reform. Now we will advance to the community question portion of the forum. As a reminder, each candidate will have two minutes to respond. There will be no rebuttals offered at this time. Uh, okay. Um, the first question here, so we'll go to Dr. Bailey first. Uh, talk about your position on the East Locust Creek Watershed Project in Sullivan County. Uh, for, the, for the project, I think it needs to be done for the community. Uh, I'm, I'm for the Sullivan County project. There were a lot of uh, uh, legislators that did, or legislators that did good, good, strong work on that. Zach Wright did a lot of work on it. Casey Guernsey did a lot of work on it. And uh, Senator Lager did a lot of work on it. And uh, it was a good project. It was needed for that community. And uh, I think it's very beneficial to that community. Representative Walker. That's right. A lot of people have worked hard on for the Locust Creek uh, Reservoir Project. In fact, Kip Bond was one of the first people to work on it. Representative White worked hard on it. Uh, Representative uh, Rebecca McClanahan worked hard on it. But what happened was they were in a stale position. And last year they came to me and they came to Senator Logger and they said, we need some money to get this thing moving forward to make sure we get the procurement of the rest of the land. And at the last moment, we put $4 million in the budget for uh, this project. It was in the DNR budget. and. Uh, 
It went through the House and passed bipartisan, went to the Senate and passed bipartisan, and when it went to the governor's desk, the governor withheld the funds, and then he with released the funds. He came up to Myland last fall, released two million of it, and then he released the last two million this spring. And as a result of that, we have this project now moving forward. And without that money, we would be not moving uh, as we are. It's very, very important. It's not just for Sullivan County. It's actually for 14 counties in North Missouri. And it's a big part of the economic development infrastructure. And uh, without my leadership and without the leadership of a lot of North Missouri people and knowing who to contact. And the first person I contacted was Tom Flanagan. And Tom Flanagan is the vice president of the budget. He will be the budget director next, next year probably. Uh, Tom and I have known each other since college. And um, he helped me get it. And then we have great Northwest days. And we made sure that all the legislators, when they came by the Sullivan County booth, knew about it. And it's a very important project supported by the administration and also the legislature. Thank you. Representative Walker, you'll answer this two-part question first. Do you feel term limits should be done away with? Do lobbyists currently have too much influence because of term limits? Explain your position. Well, I'm, you know, term limits have not been as positive as what people want, and I'll tell you why. Uh, when I was in the legislature back in the, the 70s, uh, there, were no, there were no such thing as term limits, and so people served times. But term limits have a way of working uh, by the voters. And so some people were, if they didn't do a good job, they were, they were released. What has happened, though, with term limits, and term limits are not going to affect me. I'm a freshman in, in, the, in the House. But what happens is, with term limits, people uh, tend to have to think a little further ahead on what they're going to do if they want to go up the political ladder. Right after I was elected, uh, people were going, well, he's going to run against Craig Redmond, and he'll be the, there'll be a big battle for a primary and all this kind of stuff. Well, Craig Redmond and I are good friends, and so we're not going to be running against each other for the Senate. And I only live one day at a time. Uh, term limits will not apply to me one way or the other. I'm still a freshman legislator. Um, but term limits have hurt the institution somewhat as far as institutional knowledge. And I'm the only member in the House, along with Chris Kelly, who served uh, uh, in the 80s, and uh, sometimes Chris and I have gotten on the floor. He's a Republican. I mean, he's a Democrat, and I'm a Republican, and just talk about some institutional knowledge. Because we have people now that are speakers that have only been in the legislature for two terms or three terms. And, uh, Sarah, you've worked down there. You know that uh, uh, it takes a while to, to learn the whole process. And uh, in the olden days, uh, a speaker would probably be a, uh, a committee chair for two or three uh, sessions and he might get onto the budget and so forth and work his way up. One of the reasons that we have some problems is that term limits have caused leadership uh, to maybe people go into leadership too early. Thank you. Dr. Bailey? I'm for term limits. I think they're a good thing. I need, think we need a continual turnover down in Jeff City. I think we need fresh blood, new leadership. Uh, all the time. We see a problem right now in the United States House of Representatives and Senate. But Senators, Congressmen being in there for 20 plus years, and a lot of them are senile and they're still voting on bills. We definitely need term limits, those types of things, to ensure that that doesn't happen. And then we need a continual turnover so that we're not having the same opinions, same mindset. We need new young blood, new thinking. Uh, to take care of the new modern problems that are occurring all the time. So we definitely need term limits. And uh, worrying about the, all of everybody's political future, we need um, people from the community and people in different backgrounds becoming representatives, good people, to go down there and give those new opinions and uh, new leadership and a new mindset at different times. So I think term limits are good, and I think they ought to be continued. Dr. Bailey, we uh, direct the last question to you first. We save the best for last here. What one attribute do you respect in your opponent? Hmm. 
I mean, he's very courteous. Uh, I haven't really seen him be unkind to me at any time or the people around me. Um, so, overall, I really don't know. <laughs> Representative Walker? Well, I like his challenge. He's very fierce. I mean, he's taking about everything he can throw at me, and I'm still standing. So, I respect his uh, ability to put up a good uh, campaign uh, effort to try to destroy me or beat me. So, I respect that from him. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm real proud of is the quote by Theodore Roosevelt, Courage in the Arena. And I live my life by that. And so this is just another chapter of my life, and it's kind of brutal, it's kind of ugly, but I'm enjoying it. It is time for closing statements. As a reminder, each candidate has three minutes to make his remarks. Dr. Bailey, we ask you to make your closing statement first. Again, I'd like to thank uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to thank the members of the panel. I'd like to thank ATSU for providing the facility. And it's nice to come back and uh, spend time in the classroom that I've spent many hours in educating and as a student. And again, I'd like to thank for everybody allowing me to share my views tonight. I also want to thank the many people across the 3rd District that I've had a chance to meet and discuss issues and decisions with uh, that we face today. I've been very humbled by the kindness, encouragement, and support I've received throughout this campaign and hope to meet many more of you in the coming days. Is this the case at the end of any hard-fought campaign? The choice boils down to a simple question. Are we happy with the direction our country and state are headed in? Or do you feel, as I do, that we're on the wrong track and need to make some changes? To turn, out our state, or to turn around our state and nation, we can't effect, or keep affecting electing the same politicians who talk like conservative during election time and then go along with liberals who are steering us down the wrong path. We need new leaders, we need new energy, and new commitment to the constitutional principles that our government was founded on. That's why I'm running for state representative. I have a plan to attract family supporting jobs to North Missouri, to rein in wasteful spending, to provide real tax relief to our farmers, small business owners, and working families. I'll be the pro-life, pro-Second Amendment voice you can count on to fight Obamacare, enforce our immigration laws, and stop radical environmentalists from threatening our family farms. My opinion has been running for office since the Jimmy Carter administration. He tries to talk conservative talk, but he's gone along with the liberals time and time again for billions of dollars in tax increases and dramatic increases in welfare spending. Even while our families, our senior citizens, our local schools, and our universities struggle to make ends meet. Job care regulations that threaten our employers and family farms have greatly increased during his terms in office. And more and more of our young people are having to leave their hometown to find good jobs. We can do better. My opponent can run and hide from his record. He can try to distort my views and vilify my supporters. But the fact remains that politicians like him got us into this mess our state and nation are in. And he'll take real change and new leadership to fix it. Representative Walker. Thank you. First of all, I want to again thank you all for giving me the opportunity to serve you as your third district state representative. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Uh, I've been transparent each week, uh, thanks to to the Kirksville Daily Express and other newspapers in the district, my column is, is reported. There's a link uh, to my web page at the state that will let you know how I vote. And it's pretty interesting uh, when uh, I get tied to Jimmy Carter. Yeah, I was tied to Jimmy Carter. I remember owning a little business down in La Plata, the little home press, and I bought, borrowed my first money and it was 8%. And I had to pay the 
interest every six months and renew. And after Jimmy Carter got the, the uh, economy going the way he did, interest rates were 20, 22 percent. So, yeah, I know a little bit about Ronald, uh, about Jimmy Carter, except here's the other side of the story. In 1976, I was a delegate, an alternate delegate to the Republican National Convention for Ronald Reagan. 1980, I was a delegate for Ronald Reagan to the Republican Convention and uh, placed a vote for him to become President of the United States and get the nomination. Uh, I find that uh, all these little tricky ads and everything else are, are fun and clever. Uh, I've enjoyed them. Uh, it's made me uh, have more than 100% name ID. I think I started out with 96% name ID, and now it's even over 100 because people they don't even you know, they they think they know me even if they don't. But uh, I've enjoyed the opportunity to serve you all. I will continue to work hard for you. This is a full-time effort. It's not a part-time job. It's a time. It's a job that requires you to go into the Capitol at six in the morning, leave at 10 or 11 at night, and uh, during the interim. This district is so large that you can't get to everything that you need to be, but at least I try. And one of the things that I prided myself on is that I listen to you, and I try to do the right thing, and uh, with your continued support, uh, not many liberals get a 100% voting record uh, from the NFIB, 100% voting record from the Chamber of Commerce, or get endorsed by the NRA, or get endorsed exclusively by the uh, National Right to Life, or the Missouri Right to Life. And uh, I have a, I'm very proud of uh, my voting record, and uh, I'm proud to serve you as your third district state representative. I will continue to listen to you. And once again, this district is not for sale as long as I'm your state representative. Thank you very much. Thank you to our candidates, A.T. Still University, the Truman Media Network, our panel members, the Churchill, Kirksville Chamber of Commerce Governmental Affairs Committee, and you, the public, who came out tonight and listened online. Can we have a round of applause for our candidates? You've been listening to a rebroadcast of the 3rd District Candidates Forum sponsored by the Kirksville Area Chamber of Commerce. The media representatives on the panel included Jason Hunsaker of the Kirksville Daily Express, Paul Shipman of Bot Radio, Sarah Stubert of the Governmental Affairs Committee of the Kirksville Chamber, and John Garlock of KTVO. I'm Mark Smith, and this has been a public affairs presentation of the Truman Media Network and KTRM.